All right, hello everybody. My name is Hayden Crouchel. I'm going to be doing a review of porous media, some definitions we've gone over in class. Uh, so porous media are mostly solid materials with internal pores that allow fluids to flow through them. Uh, the main way that we characterize these media is through the porosity, which is defined as the void volume over the total volume. So this is looking at the volume, the total void volume of the pores as a ratio to the total volume of the media. Another way that we commonly characterize porous media is through their specific surface, which is defined as the total interface area over the total volume. So your total interface area is essentially the surface area of your pores over the total volume. Now, both of these quantities are dependent on the structure of the media uh, and can change if something happens to your media. Uh, we're gonna take a look at an example of that now. So we're gonna consider a porous media that is subjected to this compression we're gonna find the porosity before and after the deformation. So we'll remember that our porosity is our void volume over our total volume. So for our initial case, we're gonna consider N number of pores and the volume of each pore is of the volume of a cylinder, which would be pi. We're gonna use little r here as the radius of the pore pi squared L, and that'll be divided by the total volume of our media, which is also a cylinder. So here we'll consider that pi big R squared L. And you'll see that this ratio simplifies down to the number of pores times the ratio of radii squared. Now, if we look at our compression, and we'll take a look at the final state, we'll see that we still have the same number of pores uh, and the question also states that we'll assume the pores are rigid. So we'll still assume that they are cylinders. That's not practical, but it's just a simplifying assumption. So this is our initial. And here we'll consider the final. So we'll still have the same numerator. But here in the denominator, we'll notice that our, vo or our total volume is now a cone. And we'll recall the formula for the volume of a cone it's almost the same as a cylinder, except we get that one third term. And so you'll see the porosity decreases by a factor of a third in this example. This is very simplified. This would be much more complex in the real world. Yeah, okay, we'll continue on. Now there's multiple types of pores. Uh, this comes into play when we look at our actual definitions of porosity. So we have three pore types, passing, non-passing and isolated, as can be seen in the figure here. These pore types actually alter our definition, or sorry, our value of porosity, as isolated pores won't be considered in your void volume since no actual fluid could get to them. Another measurement that we look at in por uh, porous media is the tor uh, tortuosity. Uh, so if you have a solute molecule that's passing through, this could even be for regular fluids, passing through a pore, it travels some distance. Now, there's a theoretical minimum distance that it could travel through that pore. So the ratio of the two is known as the tortuosity. We'll do an example of finding that now. So using this passing pore, we'll assume that a real particle moves according to the equation given and takes on average five seconds to travel through the pore. We'll also assume that the minimum distance can be approximated through the midpoint of the pore, just to simplify this question a little bit. So we'll see here that L min is 2R. Now to find L, the actual distance that a pore travels on average, we're gonna take our position equation and integrate this over time noticing that it's a function of time. And this result gives us twenty four units. Now to calculate our tortuosity.
we just plug these numbers in. And there's our final answer. So it's not too complicated. Now, considering solute molecules passing through a pore, uh, one can consider that the solute molecule actually may be too big to enter the pore and pass through it. So this is taken into account in our available volume fraction, which is defined as the available volume over your total volume. So the available volume is defined as the available volume inside of your pores. So this can be limited by if you also have solute molecules inside the pore already, which would block more molecules to pass through it. Another definition we have in porous media is the partition coefficient, which is our ratio of available volume to void volume. And this effectively measures the ratio of solute location and equilibrium, how much is outside versus inside the pores. Uh, because of this definition, we also notice that if we divide both by total volume, we can recover our available volume fraction over our porosity. And this is just another formula for that. Okay, I'll go ahead and pass this off to Griffin to cover fluid flows through porous media. All right, hello, my name is Griffin Jasper, and today we're going to be going through uh, the fluid mechanics of fluid flow through porous media. And specifically, we're going to be talking about the bigger names. So Darcy, Navier, Stokes, and Brinkman. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start with the Brinkman equation, and then we're gonna work our way to Darcy and Navier, Stokes. So starting with Brinkman, you have three terms. You have the dynamic viscosity times the divergence of the velocity vector. You have one over your hydraulic conductivity. For reference, your hydraulic conductivity is your specific permeability K, which we'll be discussing in a little bit, divided by your dynamic viscosity. Um, and that's also going to be multiplied by the velocity vector. And then you have your pressure gradient. So to talk about Brinkman, it's compatible with porous media that can't have its boundary conditions neglected. Um, so in our case, uh, we're going to be looking at how Brinkman simplifies into Darcy and um, Navier-Stokes where those are special cases of Brinkman. Brinkman is more generalized, again, um, a generalized equation where your uh, boundary, boundary conditions are less negligible. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define it based on our K value. So we're gonna start with Darcy, which is a specific case of our Brinkman equation where we have a small, K value. A small K value indicates that there is a higher fraction of our fluid phase, or sorry, of our solid phase. Um, and with this, we know that the absolute value of our um, one over H is going uh, times the velocity vector is going to be much greater than our divergence term. And so because of that, we're gonna get something that looks like one over H times our velocity vector minus our pressure gradient is equal to zero. Now this is Darcy's law. And this assumes that this term right here is our viscous resistance at our fluid solid interface. So we're assuming that that viscous force is much greater than the other viscous force, this one, which is our viscous stress within our fluid. And so with that in mind, we know that our Navier-Stokes equation is gonna be just the opposite, a large K which indicates a higher fluid phase and a smaller solid phase. And so for this one, we're gonna get the opposite that one over H times our velocity vector is much smaller than our dynamic viscosity times our divergence of our velocity vector. And so with that, we get that 
is equal to zero. And that's our Navier Stokes equation. And with this in mind, we know that both of them also have pressure gradients. Okay, so we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about Navier Stokes and Darcy's law specifically. So let's take a look at this figure here. So we have a free frill region and a porous media region. So we know that for our free, our free flow region, that our K is gonna be larger. Um, and then we know for this one that our K is gonna be smaller. So looking at this, we also need to make some general assumptions. So let's start with that. We're gonna assume for general cases anyway, um, we're gonna assume incompressible fluids We're also going to assume that we're dealing with Newtonian fluids. And finally, we're gonna assume laminar flow. In other words, our RE value, our Reynolds number, which is the same as our density times our velocity times our characteristic length L divided by our dynamic viscosity is going to be small. So the dynamic viscosity is going to dominate over the velocity. And why are we doing this? Well, if we go back to the Brinkman equation, we can see that all the terms in here are all viscous forces and inertial forces aren't necessarily considered. They're dominated by viscous forces just the same as laminar flow, where the dynamic viscosity is dominating over our velocity. So let's examine this further. And we're gonna do that by looking at our Navier-Stokes equation for general cases. So for here, we're obviously looking at our free flow region where our K is large. And for here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume steady flow. So this term is gonna go away. Um, we're also gonna, for simplicity's sake, ignore gravitational effects. So this term will go away. And then there's two ways that you can get rid of this final term here. Um, since we're gonna be using our continuity equation for incompressible flow, you can see that the velocity gradient is gonna be zero, or you can say that because we're dealing with laminar flow, this viscous term over here is gonna dominate our, our inertial term for velocity. So either way, this is gonna to go to zero. And so you're gonna get what's called the creeping flow for Navier-Stokes, which is the same as what was defined above where you have um, is equal to zero. So that's our creeping flow. Um, and then uh, this is the form that's prominently seen within Brinkman. And so from here, this is how Navier-Stokes will simplify to go into the, the Brinkman equation. And this is for cases specifically where we have a large K, i.e a free flow region. Okay, so we're gonna move on to Darcy now. So Darcy has a bit more assumptions that we need to make us top from the general assumptions that I made earlier about incompressible flow, uh, Newtonian fluids, and then laminar flow. So on top of this, we know that obviously K is gonna be small. Um, and we also need to define three cases where Darcy's law is not valid. So case one is for non-Newtonian fluids. Case two is for Newtonian fluids at high velocity where inertial forces are significant. And then for three, we're gonna have gases at low or high 
velocities. We're only going to be working with liquids in our examples. So as some final assumptions, we're going to assume that our porous medium is homogeneous and isotropic with our representative elementary volume, well, within our representative elementary volume. So all pores are the same and fluid flow will be measured exactly the same. This is our representative elementary volume, our REV. And we also need to make one more assumption that our characteristic pore size delta is much smaller than the size of our representative elementary volume L, fancy L. And then that is much smaller than our total porous medium size, capital L. So from here, we get that Darcy's law is the velocity equals the negative hydraulic conductivity times our pressure gradient. And then for reference again, hydraulic conductivity is the same as our specific permeability divided by our dynamic viscosity. Um, for our purposes, gravitational forces are neglected, but if you were to have gravitational forces, you would have um, the velocity is equal to the negative hydraulic conductivity times the pressure gradient minus your density, your fluid density times the gravitational flow in whichever direction you're dealing with. Um, and for both the Navier-Stokes simplification and the Darcy's law simplification, because we're dealing with incompressible flow, we can also assume that our continuity equation, oops, that our continuity equation applies. Um, for the Navier-Stokes equation, we saw that this would get rid of this inertial term right here. For Darcy's law, what we can know about this is as a specific case, if we were to be dealing with um, sources or sinks, which in this case, a source is um, a, fluid, a fluid production and then sink is fluid consumption. Um, so if we have sources and sinks where we know that um, a source is a point of no fluid production, and then we know that a sink is a point of no fluid consumption, we can rewrite our continuity equation as phi B minus phi L, where B is our volumetric flow rate per unit of porous media volume for our source. And then phi L is the same, but for a sink. Okay, so we're gonna do an example problem real quick. Um, that's gonna encompass sort of everything that we've learned in porous media. So to prevent excess saturation of water in soil, ceramic pots will include pores that allow for excess water to seep out of the soil. So we have a ceramic pour or a picture of ceramic pores. For this one, we're gonna call this our REV, where D, and then we're gonna make that L. D is much less than L, which is much less than capital L. Let me actually make this a fancy L. Okay, so if I went to the store and I bought the above ceramic pot with homogeneous cylindrical pores, all pores are uniformly distributed and the water can occupy all available porous volume. Um, the water I am using can be idealized to an incompressible Newtonian fluid with laminar flow um, based on the information provided in the figures, as well as our knowledge, can we answer this? So I'm going to give the audience a minute. All right. So for part A, what we're going to do is, as we learned in Hayden's lecture, our specific surface is our total interface area. Divided by our um, total volume. And then we know that our porosity is our, sorry, is our void volume divided by our total volume. And then because the question wants it in terms of NA, 
we can say that NA is our um, number of cylinders per unit of cross-sectional area, i.e. it's going to be big N over cross-sectional area A, which A is our cross-sectional area of our entire porous medium. So we can say that S is going to be equal to our total interface area, which is our cylindrical area being interacted with, pi DL times our number of cylinders, divided by the total volume, which for simplicity's sake, we're gonna use cross-sectional area A times our length. So we know that N over A is the same as little na. So, well, and then the Ls are gonna cancel. So we're gonna get pi times D little na. For our porosity, our void volume is going to be our cross-sectional area of our cylinder. So it's gonna be pi times d squared over four times L. Um, and then we're gonna multiply that by the number of pores. That's our void volume. And then we're gonna divide that by the total volume again. So the L's cancel. And then this becomes pi times d squared over four of n little a. Okay, so quickly for part B, Say there is a no-slip boundary condition between the water and each pore. And then assuming we have a low specific permeability, would the Brinkman equation simplify into Darcy's law? And we're gonna justify using the no-slip condition and, okay. So we're gonna start with the no-slip condition. So we know that a no-slip condition, its velocity profile is going to look like this, where the velocity gets greater, the farther away it is from the surface. And then at this point, there is zero velocity relative to our solid interface. So this is going to imply a higher viscous resistance at our interface. And then from here, as you may remember earlier in the lecture, our viscous resistance is defined as mu over K, otherwise known as one over the hydraulic conductivity times our velocity gradient. And this term dominates specifically when we're looking at Darcy's law. So that's how we justify using the no slip condition. If we wanted to use the specific permeability K, we were told that the specific permeability is very small. So U over K is going to be much greater than one. And so for this case, we could also say that it's going to dominate over our viscous stress term in fluid, which if you remember is the dynamic viscosity times our divergence of our velocity. And so from here, based on the assumptions that we made earlier within the question, and then based on what we know from our lecture, we can say that Brinkman would simplify into Darcy's law. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Jason and Ian um, to talk about fluidized beds. Hi, my name is Jason. I'll be talking about flow through packed beds. These packed beds are used in the industry as catalytic reactors absorption of solutes, absorption and filter beds. These packed beds are composed of particles that are non-fluidized and has fluid flowing through them. The packed column can be described as a bundle of crooked tubes because of the structure of how the flow comes through the packed bed and how the pattern that which the fluid flows through. In this situation, channeling will be neglected where the fluid has no preferential path through the packed bed. Starting with laminar flow, similar to uh, a porous media, we look at the void fraction, which is the volume of the void in the bed over the total bed volume. 
This void fraction is important in the uh, equations we'll be looking at for packed beds. Moving on to the specific surface of this bed, described by A sub V, we'll be looking at it as the surface area of the bed over the total volume. Um, and this specific surface area is for the actual particles in the bed and not the bed itself. For spheres, this specific surface area can be described as six over the diameter of the particle. Um, for non-spherical particles, the effective particle diameter is six over uh, this specific surface area. The total ratio for um, surface area to bed volume can be described as the specific surface area times one minus the void volume or porosity, um, which would be six over the particle diameter times one minus void volume. Moving on to material from a lecture from the University of Florida, the packed bed particles can be looked at uh, as having three different regions. Um, getting a close look at the particles, this circled in particle would represent one of these particles in the bed. As you can see, outside of the dotted line, we have the flowing mobile phase, which would just be the liquid or the fluid that's flowing past these particles. Uh, again, just to specify, in packed beds, the particles are immobilized, meaning that um, the pressure drop would not cause these particles to uh, be mobile which is why we can now look inside of the dotted line, but not in the, um, the striped area. This would be the stagnant mobile phase, which would be fluid that is close enough to the particle pores where um, they are effectively not, it's the fluid's not mobile. And the striped area itself would be the support material, which is another word for the particle or the stationary phase. Um, it's called the stationary phase because it wouldn't be flowing with the fluid itself, but remaining in the packed structure of the bed. Because of these different areas, we can look at different areas of porosity within this packed bed. The inner part, intra particle porosity, uh, which would be um, sub P, can be looked at as the pore volume over the empty column volume. And by pores, we're talking about these areas within the particle itself, where you can find the stagnant mobile phase. In addition, we can calculate the inter-particle velocity, which is the volume outside of the support over the empty column volume. So this would be where the fluid is flowing, where there's no support or stationary phase, but it also does not include the stagnant mobile phase or the fluid. For most packed beds, you can look at the total porosity as around 0.8. Um, and that would be for most of the packed beds you'd be looking at, especially those with spherical particles. Now we'll look at the Reynolds number for packed beds, um, similar to normal flows that we'd be looking at. The packed beds rely on the Reynolds number to determine turbulence, and laminar flow, basically the type of flow. Um, like before, we're gonna be looking at D sub P as the diameter, diameter of the particles in the packed bed. Um, the Reynolds number looks similar to what we'd be looking at in other situations where we have rho U times DP times the porosity over one minus porosity times the viscosity of the fluid. For packed beds, the Reynolds numbers that we'd be looking at for turbulent flow would be anything over 100. Laminar and turbulent is one to 100 and laminar flow would be anything lower than one. To calculate the average velocity of the fluid moving through the bed, we can look at the pressure drop times the specific permeability coefficient times solvent viscosity times porosity, times the length of the bed. For packed bed flow, to so look at the friction factor, 
we would look at Ergon's equation listed here. And from the Ergon equation, we can take the Cosini Karman equation and the Burke Plummer equation to get these specific friction factors at Reynolds numbers below one or above 1000. Um, and this would just be at different stages of the flow, whether it be laminar or turbulent. Um, also, another important factor in flow through packed beds would be the shape factor, where this is the ratio of the surface area of a sphere with the same volume as the actual particle to the actual surface area of the sphere. So if we're looking at the area of the surface of the sphere, this would be the actual area of the particle. And that will help us calculate um, values for this packed bed, especially where our particles are non-spherical. So to calculate the actual surface area of the particle, this would be six over the shape factor times the particle diameter. And now Ian will take over for fluidized beds. Hello, my name is Ian Walsh. I'm gonna be going over flows and fluidized beds to follow up with Jason's flows and packed beds. So you can see here, so typically in packed beds, as I explained before, the solid particles are stationary while the fluid passes through them. In fluidized beds, however, the fluid moves with a high velocity that causes the solid particles to car be carried along with it. The entire bed of particles are then transported as a fluid, which offers a number of advantages uh, in, in many different settings, such as the agitation of solid particles to maintain uniform temperatures under highly exothermic conditions where there's a lot of heat being generated in the catalysts. Uh, today, you know, common examples of fluidized beds are found in catalyst regeneration, solid gas reactors, coal combustion, ore roasting, drying, and gas absorption. Uh, so the, the velocity at which a bed of particles becomes fluidized is known as the minimum fluidization velocity, VF. And that's the point where, you know, as said before, the solid particles begin to be carried along with the fluid itself. What we can do is we can take the net weight of the bed and equate it with the upward force to obtain an expression for the pressure drop across the bed. So you see here we have one minus... Uh, epsilon, which is the void fraction. We have L is the bed height. Uh, rho sub P is particle density. Rho sub F is fluid density. And A is the cross-sectional area of the bed. Um, and we have one minus the void fraction times cross-sectional area times the bed height, which is equivalent to the volume of the particles, times the difference in density between the particles and the fluid times the gravitational acceleration constant. That is equated to the upward force, which is the pressure drop times the cross-sectional area of the bed. And here you see we obtain the expression for the pressure drop. Now, typically for very small solid particles, the fluid flow exhibits a small Reynolds number, which allows us to use the cosine karman approximation of the Ergon equation as explained previously by Jason. And this allows us to obtain this expression here to solve for the minimum fluidization velocity. Uh, an important note though, is that this is only applicable for particles with a DP equivalent spherical diameter value of equal to or less than 0 0.1 millimeters. So it needs to be a very, very small catalyst. And you see over here uh, is again in the, how to solve for the DP, which is six times the volume of the particle over the surface area of the particle. And of course, mu is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. Uh, and of course, you know, now that these solid particles are moving with the fluid, it becomes possible for the solid particles to actually be carried out of the bed along with the fluid. Uh, and this occurs if the superficial velocity, uh, which is equivalent to the minimum fluidization velocity when it first starts to be fluidized, uh, if the superficial velocity equals the settling velocity of the particles themselves. And since we're taking uh, small particles into consideration, we can use Stokes' law to obtain an expression for the settling velocity, V settling, and that is what you see here. Um, and now that we have expressions for the fluid minimum fluidization velocity and the settling velocity, we can put the two into a ratio. And what we find here is that it's a ratio of 25 over three times one minus the void fraction over the void fraction cubed. And, that gives us the ratio of V settling to VF.
Uh, commonly, fluidized beds are operated at, at values around 30 VF, um, but sometimes have been reported even as high as 100. Um, and again, if your the the VF velocity is equal to or greater than the settling velocity, the particles will be carried out of the fluidized bed. Um, and just a note here, so because operating at high velocities is important for many of the, the settings in which fluidized beds are, are useful, um, that means that the super fine particles are going to be carried out, but we can use filters or separators to, to recover the particles and put them back into the beds so that can be continued to be used. Um, and now I'm going to go over an example problem for fluidized beds. Um, so here we have a cylindrical packed bed of height 5 meters and diameter 0 0.5 meters. Uh, is to be fluidized to aid a catalytic chemical reaction. The catalyst particles are cylindrical and have 0 0.20 millimeter height and 0 0.08 millimeter diameter. And the void fraction of the bed is 0 0.48. The total mass of the particles in the bed is 2,500 kilograms. The fluid being used to fluidize the bed has a density of 500 kilograms per cubic meter and a dynamic viscosity of 0 0.02 kilograms per meter per second. So first we need to show that the cosine carmen approximation of the Ergen equation is valid for these conditions. And then we're gonna calculate the minimum fluidization velocity VF, and then calculate the ratio of the settling velocity of the catalyst particles to the minimum fluidization velocity, which is of course is V settling over VF. So here we have the solution. So remember the cosine carbon approximation is valid for equivalent spherical diameters less than or equal to 0 0.1 millimeters. And we can calculate that by doing six times the volume over the surface area. And the volume of the cylinder is pi r squared times the height. And the surface area is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r times the height. And here we get that the equivalent spherical diameter is equal to 0 0.1 millimeters just at the cutoff. So it is a valid approximation. So for part B, we have the equation for the minimum fluidization velocity. And we need to solve for rho sub p, because that was not given to us. And of course, uh, density is mass divided by volume. So we have that rho sub p is equal to 2,500 kilograms divided by pi times 0 0.25 meters squared times the height of 5 meters times 1 minus the void fraction 0 0.48. And this is going to equate to about 4,897 kilograms per meter cubed. So very dense catalyst particles. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and take this value and plug it into here. Um, then you see what we have here. So 4,897 minus 500, which is given fluid density, gravitational acceleration constant, dp squared, all the other, all the other variables that we have and we end up with a fluidization velocity of 3.06 times 10 to the negative fourth meters per second. And then we're going to move on to part C, where now we're going to calculate the velocity, the settling velocity of the particles. Um, so again, we're going to use rho sub p here and all the other constants that we have um, filled out here. And we get 0 0.012 meters per second. And of course, then now we can put these two in a ratio to determine that the ratio is 39.2. And you can do that two different ways because above, um, we determined that V settling to VF is this ratio, which is just a uh, proportionality constant and then one minus epsilon over epsilon cubed. Or you could, of course, if you have V settling and VF, you can use those two velocities themselves. And so that's what you, was what's reflected here. There's two different ways. Both get you the same answer, of course, uh, which essentially says that your settling velocity is 39.2 times as great as your minimum fluidization velocity. So again, if your minimum fluidization velocity exceeds that, your particles are going to start to be carried out of the bed and then you know, can be recovered by a filter. Um, but that's 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 the gist of it for for fluidized beds. Um, and so thank you. The short example will demonstrate an increase in velocity and pressure drop through a packed bed until we see the onset of minimum fluidization. As the fluid velocity increases, we see an expansion in the bed and the porosity until we see fluidization. Thank you for watching.